Good evening, everyone. I'm Natan Meir, professor in the Judaic Studies program. I want to welcome you all to the uh, eighth annual Gus and Libby Solomon Memorial Lecture. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to um, call your attention to a few upcoming events in, um, in the Judaic Studies program's calendar of events. Uh, hopefully everyone's received this flyer, uh, which uh, advertises um, our annual Loquet Lecture, which is coming up in a few weeks which will be delivered by Professor Dina Aronoff of Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, who's going to be speaking about conversas and continuity, retrieving Jewish history from the records of the Spanish Inquisition. Um, Professor Aronoff teaches uh, medieval and early modern Jewish history, uh, and she's a fantastic speaker. And as you can tell, the topic is a very, very interesting one. So I encourage you to, um, to join us for that. And I also want to let you know about a very exciting event that's coming up in April, um, which is being organized by Professor Nina Spiegel, who is our new um, Rabbi Stanford Professor of Israel Studies. Um, and Nina is already in her first year putting together a, uh, a fantastic program on April 17th, which is going to feature um, one of Israel's um, most renowned choreographers, um, Idan Cohen who is going to present an evening of performance and discussion at BodyVox, um, and that's on April 17th. So for anyone who has any interest in, in contemporary Israel, in dance, um, in, the way, in, in performance, and the way all these intersect, that should be a fascinating evening. Our speaker tonight, Samuel Norwich, is the publisher of The Forward, American Jewry's newspaper of record, um, which is actually a publishing group, which includes The Forward in both digital and print formats, as well as the Yiddish language Der Vorwärts, which is soon to be relaunched, in a sense, in a new interactive um, web page that I, I think Sam will tell you more about. From 1980 to 1992, Sam was executive director of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, the world's preeminent institution devoted to the documentation and study of the history and culture of East European Jewry and its American offshoot. Sam has also distinguished himself as an analyst of American Jewry's communal structures, and he's the author of What Will Bind Us Now, a report on the institutional ties between Israel and American Jewry. Born in a displaced persons camp in Germany in 1947, the son of Polish Jews, Sam emigrated to the US with his family in 1957 and was educated at Columbia University, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the University of Wisconsin. Sam is also uh, a close personal family friend of mine. He's also been a mentor and a teacher to me over the years. So it's a, um, a special pleasure to have him here with us. I want to also note that um, Sam will be giving another lecture this weekend um, at the Oregon Jewish Museum on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. called Comics, Journalism, and Society with, I understand, a light brunch as well. So uh, make, you, can, you have to make reservations for that um, on, on Sunday morning. Um, I know that many of you here know the forward well, and I've actually heard quite a few stories tonight <laughs> one-on-one -on -one from people um, about family stories that involve the forward in one way or another. Maybe your parents or grandparents read the forward, the, the forwards. Um, maybe, hopefully, you read it today online or in print. Um, and some of our students may be reading it um, in their classes as well. Uh, just by the way, could, if you're a student at PSU, could you raise your hand, please, just so we can get a sense? Oh, nice. Thank you. I think it's especially fitting that Sam is giving the Gus and Libby Solomon lecture this evening. In his words, and especially in his deeds, Gus Solomon was a proponent of the American Jewish tradition of social justice that the forward has also been known for. And appropriately, his son Dick welcomed me to Portland by 
giving me a subscription to the forward. <laughs> Thank you. So it is with great pleasure that I present to you Sam Norwich, who will speak on the forward in the age of Facebook, the story of a Jewish newspaper. Uh, thank you, Atan. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back in Portland. Um, having been invited once two and a half decades ago by Rabbi Stamfer uh, when I was director of YIVO, it's, it's so wonderful to be able to be back and to see him here and um, to join you for this annual lecture. I'm grateful to Natan Meir for having uh, proposed that I be invited, and I'm uh, doubly grateful to, um, to Dick Solomon for having created, uh, having chosen this as a way to honor the memory of his parents. Um, in the early 80s, I once had the honor of uh, introducing Abba Iban to an audience in New York. And um, uh, when he got up to the mic, Iban said that the week before he had spoken at a Rotary Club in Macon, Georgia, and the president of the club uh, introduced him by saying, uh, some of us have heard Mr. Iban before, some of us have not, and those who have not are really looking forward to it. <laughs> So I hope there's nobody here who heard me 25 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, I know I don't. I, I know that um, Rabbi Stamford doesn't have to worry. Um, he just said to me he was holding his copy of the forward, and he said, "If I get bored, I have something to read." <laughs> um, there are more copies outside. <laughs> Um, uh, I was I was uh, delighted and astonished to meet uh, Paul Schur here a few minutes ago, uh, a Luntzman from Teaneck, New Jersey, um, which we often refer to as Da Teaneck. Um, but um, he was he was going on and on about how he loves the forward, and I thought that it might be a good use of my time to devote, let him speak for about a half hour. <laughs> um, and, and then go on. Um, but that's not what I was invited to do. Um, I, want to, I want to tell you about uh, what we're doing with this newspaper in the age of Facebook. Uh, the Forward is widely regarded as American Jewry's essential independent news organization, delivering incisive coverage of the issues, ideas, and institutions that matter to American Jews with rigorous, unbiased reporting and balanced, thoughtful commentary on news, on politics, on arts and culture, in both English and Yiddish. We all know the Vorwärts from days of yore, but the Vorwärts today is a 115-year-old startup. It's true that we've been reporting the, Jew the American Jewish story for generation after generation after generation. For most of the 20th century, more people read us than any other Jewish newspaper in the world. Really, for the first seven decades of the 20th century, more people read the foreword than any other new Jewish newspaper in any other language. In the 1960s, um, Mariv outgrew us. And of course, Yediot has since outgrown Ma'ariv, and Israel Hayom, Israel today, has since then outgrown Yediot, Yediot Achronot. 
um, at its peak in the 1920s, just when Congress cut off immigration from Eastern Europe, our Yiddish edition had over a million readers a day, which in those days was more than the New York Times had. We were among the first American newspapers to be published nationally, with local editions in every major metropolitan area that had a large number of Jews. We jumped on the new technology of broadcast radio as soon as it became popular in the 1920s. The man who had my job in the 1920s and 30s, Baruch Charney Vladek, was on our radio station every Sunday in the 1930s. Uh, addressing half a million people every week. He was a member of the city council, then called the Board of Aldermen. He and he, as the leader of the socialist faction in the city council, and Fiorella LaGuardia as the leader of the Republican faction in the city council, together formed the fusion ticket that beat the Tammany Hall machine in 1934. And the deal between them was that uh, Fiorella LaGuardia would be mayor for two terms with Vladek's help, and then Vladek would be mayor for two terms with LaGuardia's help. They, did, they couldn't keep that bargain because Baruch Charney Vladek died of a heart attack in 1938 at the age of 50. But it gives you a sense of what this newspaper was. Uh, we've served an audience that spanned generations, that reached across this country and beyond, that looked to the forward as a way to connect to community and home while we were busily transcending them. Uh, as we reported the news that affected generations of immigrants a century ago, so we report the news affecting our readers today. Earlier, and with more insight than the mainstream media, more incisively and more independently than the Jewish media. We tell the Jewish story from the inside. We're unbossed and unbought unlike a growing number of Jewish and general media organizations. And our journalism in print and on digital platforms have won more professional journalism awards in recent years than any American publication our size, and more than many that are far larger. As you can imagine, I speak pretty often about the forward about one aspect of it or another. And I found that people ask many different kinds of questions, but three questions get asked most frequently. People want to know, first, what accounted for the Vorwärts' unmatched success? Why was it the largest? Second, how do you explain its survival when all its competitors folded 50 or 70 years ago. And third, people want to know, will there be a forward, and more, more questioningly, will there be a Vorwärts in five or 10 years from now? I'd like to try to answer those three questions. I'd like to show you how we have transformed ourselves in these recent decades, and most especially in the last few years, to become a digital media organization. We used to be a newspaper. 
We are a digital media organization, which is a different animal altogether, which does it work, its work in many different ways than print newspapers used to, which reaches an audience that is far larger than it used to be, and an audience that cons consumes journalism in a very different way than was common in the print age. We've grown that audience very rapidly, very recently. In 2010, there, we had 1.2 million unique visitors to our website, 2010, 1.2 million. In 2012, 3.4 million unique visitors to our website. In 2010, we clocked 3,079,899 page views. Page views, anytime you, anybody comes to a page on our website, each time you come, it's another page view. But if you come from the same computer, it's only one unique visitor. The page views have grown from 2010, 3,079,000, 2012, 12,855,970. That's rapid growth. What accounted for the forward success? Two factors stand out in my mind. The fact that we saw the world from the perspective of our readers, that we spoke in their idiom, and second, that we were and are independent of the powers that be in the Jewish world and could therefore address issues that others either avoided or muffled. Let me address each of these two in turn. The Farwärts, as you know, was an immigrant's newspaper, launched in 1897 as the, uh, as the mass immigration of Yiddish-speaking Jews from Russia, Poland, Lithuania, and Romania was reaching its peak. It became, over the next decades, an immigrant primer, a daily guide to orient its readers to the world beyond their family, beyond the Lower East Side, or whatever neighborhood they lived in, beyond their Landsmannschaft, or synagogue, or other local Jewish organization that constituted the borders of their daily experience. It was an instrument of assimilation when assimilation was the program of American Jewry. It was an instrument of assimilation, as all the history books attest, helping its readers to navigate the schools, the requirements of work and politics, the tensions of family, and the often sharply different points of view of different generations. But while it helped new immigrants to make their way in America, it also gave them an anchor and a touchstone, a point of reference and connection to their collective origins, to their community. The Fawwelts, better than any other Yiddish newspaper, echoed and articulated the fierce desire of the new immigrants to become Americans, but not to lose themselves in the process. It, this was a time when Jews were held in contempt in many corners of America, when the general press often referred to Jews as uncivilized, as agents of crime and sedition. And even some in our own community 
were ashamed of the hordes of Yiddish-speaking immigrants arriving daily at Ellis Island. Many of you, I'm sure, know about the Galveston plan. The Fauverts countered this anti-Semitic trope, calling, calling on its readers to give their children every opportunity for education and advancement, and exhorting them to join unions and let their numbers weigh in at the bargaining table and at the ballot box. And the Fauverts demonstrated daily that the literary and artistic creativity of Yiddish speakers in America could be a source not only of pride, but of beauty and of joy. The Fauverts gave its readers a sense of solidarity, a sense of community, of a shared past and a common goal. No column did this better than the Bintel Brief, literally the packet of letters, the Fauvertz's advice column and the mother of all advice columns. <laughs> uh, readers asked questions ranging from the heartrending to the ridiculous. A young man wrote to the editor saying that he was in love with a young woman and he wanted to marry her, but she had a, quote, defect, unquote, that he had been told could be fatal to her spouse. She had a dimple in her chin. The young man had heard that the first husband of women with a dimple in their chin often die an early death. And he asks the editor whether there is any truth to this concern. The editor writes back that, quote, the tragedy is not that the girl has a dimple in her chin, but that some people have a screw loose in their heads. <laughs> then, then there's this letter in 1911. Dear editor, I am a newsboy, 14 years old, and I sell the Fauvelts in the streets late into the night. I come to ask your advice. I was born in Russia and was 12 years old when I came to America with my dear mother. My sister, who was in, in the country before us, brought us over. My sister worked and supported us. She didn't allow me to work, but sent me to school. I went to school for two years and didn't miss a day, but then came the terrible fire at the Triangle shop where she worked, and I lost my dear sister, one of 146 young men and women, mostly women, mostly Jews and Italians, who perished in the Triangle fire on uh, March 25th, 1911. I, I lost my dear sister. My mother and I suffered terribly from the misfortune. I had to help my mother, and after school hours, I go out and sell newspapers. I have to go to school three more years, and after that, I want to go to college. But my mother doesn't want me to go to school because she thinks I should go to work. I tell her I will work days and study at night, but she won't hear of it. Since I read the Fauvelts to my mother every night and read your answers in the Bintel brief, I beg you to answer me and say a few words to her. Your reader, the newsboy. In the answer, the editors seek to comfort the unfortunate woman, and she is told that, quote, she must not hinder her son's nighttime studies, unquote, and an appeal is made, quote, to good people who are in a position to do something for the boy to come forward and help him further his education, unquote. This is way more than advice column. This is way more than a newspaper. This is a psychiatrist's couch. This is a rabbi. 
This is a more derech, a guide. These people weren't writing in, let me know what your opinion is, I'll take it along with three other opinions, and I'll figure out what to do. These people wrote in expecting to follow the advice. That's unusual for a newspaper. This intimate chemistry between editors and readers was linked to the other secret of the forward success, its independence. The Vorwärts was never controlled or even influenced by the powers that be in America, in the Jewish community, or even in the socialist circles with which the paper identified. That independence enabled the Vorwärts to take positions on the major issues of the day that won it the trust of its readers who understood that the paper and its editors were marching to no one's beat but their own. So the Vorwärts could speak out against those in America who insisted that the United States was a Christian nation. The Vorwärts was among those who said, on the contrary, that it was a nation of all its people and all its peoples and all its religions. A century ago, the claim that this is a Christian nation was aimed against Catholics and against Jews. Today, the same claim is aimed at neither. It is instead aimed at secularists and at Muslims. The Vorwärts could speak out for economic rights, most importantly, the rights of workers to organize, even though the most powerful interests in our society and in our own community then and now are doing their utmost to subvert those rights. The Vorwärts was early and outspoken in its opposition to communism, denouncing it as a betrayal of democracy and the democratic foundation of socialism. And the Vorwärts was among the most ardent supporters of the Jewish community in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, and of the efforts beginning from 1925. It was a supporter of the efforts to create a Jewish state. That Zionist publications supported the creation of the state is no surprise. But Zionist newspapers had a small fraction of the circulation of the Fauvels, and they were preaching to the choir. The Fauvels, a socialist publication for whom support of the fledgling Jewish state was not politically correct, and which was roundly attacked in socialist circles, had far more impact on the thinking of American Jews about Israel during the middle decades of the 20th century. It really gave American Jews, who were not going to go on Aliyah, had no intention, it gave American Jews a language with which to support a Jewish state. The second question I'm often asked is how to explain the survival of the Vorwärts when all the other American Yiddish newspapers of the early 20th century folded by the 1950s or the latest by 1972. The Tug, uh, which Professor Weingrad's family read, um, merged with the Morgenjournal, the Tug being the high quality pro-Zionist bourgeois paper uh, from a standpoint of the Vorwärts, uh, merged, I, I think, sometime in the 60s with the Morgenjournal, with the Morgenjournal which was an orthodox paper, 
and um, became the Tug Morgen Journal. Uh, and that folded in 1972, and the Forward bought its subscription list. How did the Forward survive? The answer here is simple. The Vorwärts was never privately owned. It was always structured as a not-for-profit membership corporation pursuing its mission rather than seeking to make a profit. To be sure, it was extraordinarily profitable during the first half of the 20th century with a large staff and it owned buildings in all the cities in which it was published, buildings in every major metropolitan center which housed its offices uh, and its printing presses. It owned a radio station in New York and radio towers and land on which the towers were located. It had its last profitable year in 1944. We've operated in the red every year since 1945. Other Yiddish newspapers, which didn't have as large a readership, which didn't have as uh, many assets, went into the red earlier and closed, uh, mostly because they, most of them were privately owned. Yiddish literacy in America was in the decline from the 1920s on. <coughs> the children of the immigrants didn't need or want a Yiddish newspaper. In those years, you didn't want to be caught dead on the subway reading a Yiddish newspaper if you were going to City College. It was not in fashion. And there were no new immigrants coming after 1924. After the survivors of the Holocaust arrived in the US in 1949 and 1950, it was clear that there was never again going to, they would never again see a mass immigration of Yiddish speaking Jews. There wasn't from where. So if you were privately owned and you had any, any seichel, any sense, you closed shop rather than incur ever larger losses in subsequent years. But the Favorites was not privately owned. It decided to keep publishing and sold off another asset, another building, a radio station, a time on its radio station every few years. We couldn't raise the money new money. Our readership was not a wealthy readership. It couldn't sustain a fundraising effort. So the only way to keep going was to spend down assets. And a building that was worthless in the 60s might be worth something in the 70s. In 1989, we sold our FM station in order to launch the English language forward in 1990, um, which has been a separate publication from the start, rather than a translation of the Fauvelts. These are not, these two newspapers are not translations of one another, not then and not now. We do it in a more expensive way. We have two separate staffs, <laughs> but that's because we have different readerships. We sold our last major real asset, our radio station, WEVD, Eugene Victor Debs Radio. <laughs> uh, we sold our, our radio station, WEVD AM, in 2003. We invested the proceeds from that sale, and each year we draw down on those investments to cover a large portion of the operating losses of the forward and the Fauvelts. The Forward is a weekly newspaper that has had a prize-winning website for 15 years. Last year, actually almost two years ago now, it became a, di a digital media operation 
with its major focus on its online audience and on social media. The website for the first 15 years that we had a website was a byproduct of the week's print newspaper. But you can't do a website that way. Today, the priority has been reversed. We produce for the website. And each week, we take a selection of the best of the website and put it into our newspaper. The two have, again, quite different readerships. Some read both, but it's quite a different readership, with, of course, the website having a much younger readership. Young people don't read a newspaper the way us gray hairs do. We subscribe to a newspaper because the, this group of editors puts together a product that we find pretty interesting from week to week. It keeps rewarding you for coming back. And when we open a copy of the paper, we turn the pages and read whatever is on the next page. And sometimes we'll read it and sometimes we won't. But we keep coming back to the same product week after week. Most young people don't read that way at all. They don't even bookmark on their, on their web page, on their browser. That used to be, I mean, that's so 20th century. <laughs> uh, most pe young people read what their social network friends tell them they should be reading. <coughs> they read discrete articles. Here, read this. Check this out, somebody on their Facebook network tells them. That's what they read. From the perspective of a publisher, they come to you for discrete articles. They don't come to read a paper. Digital journalism cannot operate with a business model created for print publications. David Swenson, the head of the Yale Endowment, had an op-ed in the New York Times a few years ago in which he pointed out that the business model of print journalism had been made obsolete by the advent of digital media, by Craigslist, which took away classified advertising, by Google searches, and so on. He argued that quality journalism would henceforth be sustained only by a philanthropic business model that solicited donated income from those who valued it. He titled his op-ed, quote, News You Can Endow. <laughs> to be sure, our business model today has set ambitious goals for increases in our earned revenues from advertising in print and on digital platforms, as well as from print circulation. We are exceeding our business plan goals for digital circulation. We are keeping at our level in print circulation. We've grown it up actually about 1% in the past year, compared to 10% drops for most print media. We are falling short thus far in advertising revenue, but in the last four months of 2012, we had a 169% increase over the last four months of, digi of uh, advertising revenue in the last four months of 2011. So I'm hopeful for 2013. <laughs> Will there be a forward and a forwards in five or 10 years? Things are changing so rapidly in the media business that no one is making plans for more than a couple of years. I read somewhere that in a few years from now, we may be reading our daily news report on our shower curtains or even on our lower lips. So while the medium is uncertain, 
The audience for our digital products has been growing and will likely continue to grow. We are faced with new competition from websites that have been launched by prominent business people and philanthropists. Tablet, Times of Israel, uh, Israel Today, um, and others. But in the face of that competition, our audience is growing and getting younger, attracted by the quality of our reporting and opinion writing. We're changing the content, the mix of what we produce. Um, we are now doing a lot more in video, a lot more podcasts, audio, than we ever did before. It requires different training than print journalist Scott. This is what you used to call television. In a lot of ways, the production of our journalism has been transformed to keep up with the changing ways in which our audience and our hoped for audience is consuming journalism. It's now about to happen on the Yiddish side as well. The Yiddish website, which we've had for over 16 years, has been, until now, a byproduct of the weekly print Yiddish newspaper. We've added more videos to it in the last two years, um, stuff that you can't put into a newspaper. Uh, but it's, the time has come to transform this publications program into one that is really focused on the website. We still have about 2,000 subscribers to our weekly print Yiddish paper. That means about 5,000 people are reading us each week in print, mostly in the US, some in Israel, some in other countries, in Latin America and Europe. But we have an audience, a readership of just over 5,000, five to 6,000, depending on the week, that's reading us online. The print readership is most of it not going to migrate to our online site. Most of them are in their 80s and 90s, majority. Many of them are now uh, becoming computer savvy. Uh, they even know how to use uh, Skype they have to in order to talk to their grandchildren. <laughs> but uh, they're not comfortable reading a newspaper online. They prefer print paper. But the potential audience is much younger. It spans the 20s through the 70s. And it's completely international. It's people who really don't get their news from the Yiddish forward but the, the Yiddish forward is a window for them on where they came from, on Ashkenazic Jewish culture and history of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century in Europe and beyond. About those topics, there's no place you can get a better report than the Fauvelts. So we're hoping to grow that digital audience an uh, audience that will, in large part, I think, be composed of three demographics. Of children of survivors who grew up in Yiddish-speaking homes, are now in their 50s and 60s, who never had any formal training in Yiddish, have a passive knowledge of the language, enough to be able to watch a video with English subtitles and understand what's going on, enough to even read text if they have the immediate capability to click on a word or move the mouse over a word and have an English definition of the word come up. Our site will have that capacity beginning on Monday. Uh, we've... <laughs> yes! <laughs> Nobody else has that. Uh, and we have it thanks to the Comprehensive Yiddish-English Dictionary published last month by Indiana University Press, a 10-year-long project 
for which the forward was the largest single donor. No accident, comrades. <laughs> so the question is, finally, whether we can attract a growing community of donors, of donors from among our readers and from circles beyond our readers who value what we do, whether we can attract them fast enough to make up for the depleting reserves of invested funds. Make no mistake about it, this is a race. And we're running as fast as we can. So finally, whether we will have the forward and forwards a decade from now is a question only you can answer. Thank you. I believe, Jen, we have some time left for questions, comments. I prefer questions. <laughs> but I will also take comments. Please, sir. It'll be both. Okay. First of all, I'm a longtime subscriber to the print edition of the forward. I, I like it for its, its, its news, news content. However, what I don't like is the fact that they, uh, the articles are too long. In, today, in today's society, uh, with so many publications to read, it's, it's nearly impossible to, to get through. I subscribe to the Oregonian, as USA Today, and then uh, all along comes my weekly copy of the forward. I, I welcome it, and I really like it, but is there a way that they can cut down on the size of the articles and have more articles at, with taking up less space? Okay, that, that's, that's one issue that I have to... to I'm looking for a scissors here somewhere. Yeah, okay, well, you'll find it soon enough. All right. Any, anyway, next, next uh, the outfit that does your mailing, uh, supervise them a little more closely. They're uh, not any too good as far as spelling of subscribers' names, and, and then they put it on a mailing list, and it goes to somebody else, and uh, still my friend's name is is still being misspelled. But yours? I'm all right. You're OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my name's more difficult, too. Any, anyway, and then, then the third issue I want to talk to you about is. Um, can we the, talk the, afterwards, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> we, we can. Um, the third issue is the, 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 the former mayor of, of uh, New York, uh, his name is correctly pronounced LaGuardia. Not LaGuardia, as everybody says. Uh, I heard him speak in, in a recording, and his name is LaGuardia, not LaGuardia. And thirdly, most people don't know that Mayor LaGuardia was Jewish. He had a Jewish mother. His, his mother's maiden name was Cohen. And Mayor LaGuardia could speak Yiddish. Right. And uh, he once defeated a candidate, a Jewish candidate, who couldn't speak Yiddish. OK. Who wants the microphone? <laughs> Um, I, I, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> I, by the way, um, you're absolutely right about the articles being too long. For um, See, publications that are published only on the internet make the mistake of thinking that space is free, right? In print, space is expensive, but in, on the internet, space is free. So they go on and on and on and on. Uh, this is a total mistake. In the internet, things have to be short. I mean, look, um, if people come to you for dis discrete articles, they spend, what, a minute on your website? How long does it take to read an article? Um, we actually had the great good fortune and a huge achievement in that over the course of the last year and a half, we've increased the average time spent on site with this increase in the readership, in the audience that I mentioned. We've increased the average time, not the total, the average time on site from 
1.25 seconds to, from 1.25 minutes, it's bad enough. <laughs> 1.25 minutes to 2.9 minutes, okay? But in 2.9 minutes, people should be reading six articles. <laughs> so you're right, it's, it, it's gonna to have to get shorter. But, you know, we're also known for getting into a story. We're known for telling you more than the 15 seconds. Um, and uh, that's why people actually read us. That's why even these young people have learned to bookmark us and come back to it. Um, so there's a negotiation that goes on every day. And um, uh, we hired four years ago a very experienced print journalist to take us into the digital age. Jane Eisner had worked for 25 years at the Philadelphia Inquirer, had every job from cub reporter to foreign editor to opinion editor to editorial page editor, uh, every job except the top one, and uh, left it when Knight Ritter and the Philadelphia Inquirer were no longer what they had once been. But she had a new life in journalism when she came to the forward. But it, it's that kind of journalistic moxie that we want driving our digital product. And that's what it is. Um, our editors are people, I mean, top editors are one or two in their 50s. Most of our editorial staff reporters are people in their 20s. Um, most of the arts and culture coverage, which is a hefty piece of the forward, is edited by full-time staff, but almost all of it is written by freelancers. And that's how we get the quality that we can get, because we can choose from all over. And I urge some of the people here to pitch a story to the forward. Sir. Uh, so, um I first started reading the forward uh, because as an avid uh, Hebrew learner, I, I became quite addicted to the Philo Logos column uh, a couple of years ago. And um, I don't speak any Yiddish myself, but I do know some people who are quite enthusiastic about learning Yiddish and uh, use some of the, the things on the, the forward website. And I'm quite curious to see uh, what is coming soon with that. Uh, and you, you spoke a little bit about uh, the demographics of your your Yiddish uh, readership, the, the people in their, their 50s and 60s who have some passive knowledge of the language. Um, a friend of mine has a great term for that. He calls them uh, native non-speakers. <laughs> um, but uh, I was wondering if you could maybe say a few words uh, if, about some of the younger yeah. readership and uh, the demographics of that and uh, your efforts to reach younger uh, Yiddish learners and Yiddish enthusiasts. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I actually had notes to talk about three demographics and ended up speaking about only one of them, and I appreciate that prompt. Um, the other two are university students of Yiddish, uh, current and recent, and uh, the third is uh, Haredim, Hasidim, uh, on the fringes of Haredi society, who are prepared to violate the communal norms by reading the Fauvelts. <laughs> we have pictures of women. Uh, <laughs> shocking, isn't it? Right. So, I mean, we've always had Haredi readers, Hasidic readers, but they've always read it underneath their own newspaper, so nobody should notice. And, um, you know, on the internet, when you're in the privacy of your own screen, you can do stuff that, uh, you know, you don't want neighbors to see. Um, so we see, uh, we've, we're going to launch on Monday a, uh, a, a blog for Haredi writers um, called Yiddish mit an Aleph. Um, it's an in-joke. It's about how Yiddish, the word Yiddish is spelled in standard Yiddish and how they spell it, 
not standard, but they spell it with an A beginning with an Aleph rather than a double Yud. And um, the, uh, several young Haredi writers, including uh, one woman, will be writing regularly for the blog. Uh, so we are hoping that that will attract a Haredi audience who will be able to read stuff about their communities in this online publication that they can't read in their own papers. Um, so between students of Yiddish, Haredi uh, readers, and uh, uh, the native non-speakers, uh, as you call them, um, I'm hoping that we will grow a Yiddish audience uh, in the years ahead. Yes, sir. Down here? Oh, oh back to Mike's there. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering, in print, there's a very clear direction of uh, information and communication delivery. I was wondering that as you guys expand into the digital realm, do you um, see your publication as becoming more of a networking device, as creating connections within a community rather than um, a shared source of information that's just coming from one place? Uh, yes. Um, great minds think alike, and that's exactly where we're going. Um, it's already beginning to happen on some of our blogs. Uh, for instance, we have a blog on uh, Jewish, Jewish, I was going to say Jewish food, but that's a redundancy. <laughs> um, I mean, we have a food blog. It's called The Jew and the Carrot. And um, it really has become a community for people who are interested in issues of sustainability, uh, not only for recipes, but you know, questions of how we deal with food and what it means in our lives. We have a blog called The Sisterhood, which is a blog on women's issues. Uh, and that has become a international conversation among Jewish women in the US and Israel and in other countries. I don't know of another one like that um, for Jewish women. We have an arts and culture blog where, I mean, it's such a huge thing in Jewish life in America, but we're the only one that has devised a blog on arts and culture. Um, and. Uh, Look, our strength is also our weakness. Our strength is that we're national. Um, we cover the news not for the Jews of Cleveland or Baltimore or Portland, but for all of us in Cleveland and Baltimore and Portland, there are national issues, American issues, Jewish issues, Israeli issues, and we seek to give them a American Jewish perspective. We actually seek to create a community that is national. For newspapers, that's quite unusual. I mean, newspapers are local. USA Today is an exception. But, what, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Point made. Um, newspapers are local. And um, certainly Jewish newspapers are local. Uh, and we're trying to create a community that is wider than the local, but med social media is the perfect vehicle for that. It's free, right? You don't have to sell copies of the newspaper in each community. You just put it up on the website. And it creates social networks like you just described. So I think that's really... I, I, I said to Natan at lunch today that our biggest feeder, we know exactly who is sending uh, people to the forward website. Each week we get a list of how many people came from each source. The biggest feeder now is Facebook. It used to be Google, and then it was Haaretz, and for the last eight months it's been Facebook. And that's only going to grow. So uh, we are doing our journalism through the medium of social networks. Uh, who has the mics? Yes. 
About a year ago, uh, the Portland and Oregon community lost its most beloved local and regional newspaper, The Jewish Review. And I had hoped that in every one of our mailboxes, um, a subscription request would show up from the forward, to which my family has subscribed for as long as I can remember. And I was quite disappointed that that, in fact, did not happen. I think there was a market opportunity that was lost on the part of your paper. My family gives the foreword in the print version for bar and bat mitzvah gifts, for wedding gifts, at any celebration in Simcha we can think of. We give a subscription gift. And I do think you do under-market your paper. It is splendid. You should not abbreviate the articles. And I think it is a mistake to over-focus on the digital version. Pe families like having a print copy laying around on the breakfast counter. Uh, I think it would be a travesty if that were uh, cut out or diminished. But there's, anyway, there's no my, such plan. My, my plug is for your marketing people to be more aggressive and get the printed version of the forward into households and on kitchen counters. Thank you. Um, I, I really wish that Mark Blattner were here. He's in Cuba. Yes, I know. Um, but um, we had conversations about precisely what you just called for. Um, and we were prepared to offer subscriptions in everybody's mailbox. And that offer was not taken up. Um, we were very disappointed by that. Um, we're still prepared to do it. Uh, if people want to organize an effort to persuade the Federation to do something of that sort, you'll find a very willing partner in New York. Um, but uh, I take your point. Uh, I think, look, until we didn't have a marketing department until two years ago. <laughs> the, the, the Yiddish forward sort of had for decades, can you turn off the video for this part? <laughs> uh, the Yiddish forward sort of had an ideology against marketing. Uh, marketing is not simply sales. Marketing <coughs> is adjusting your product to maximize sales. It is fitting the product to its potential market. Well, after, you know, for decades now, it's been clear that the market that we sell to is in decline, and the market, the Yiddish market that's growing, is Hasidim. Well, we didn't want to transform our newspaper into that. Certainly not. And, you know, marketing? No, we don't have any, we don't need any of that. Also, it didn't have the resources to market, even if it wanted to. Um, and now we just realize that it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And um, uh, Bob Goldfarb heads, is now our director of marketing and audience development. And we now are looking to engage with audiences of people who read the forward and people who don't read the forward, like tonight. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> okay. And we'll be doing it, I mean, I can show you our schedule for the next three months. Every week, we've got people speaking in one community or another, all from Denver to LA to Houston to Boston to Baltimore, Miami, Portland, San Francisco, New York. Um, I hope that there'll be some takers. 
Yes, sir. I'm a long time uh, subscriber to the forward, and there's one section of the forward that's always fascinated me and puzzled me, and I pick up my print section and I see it again. It says, when it's le if it's legal, it's in the forward. And then there are these two pages of notices, which I've never seen in any other newspaper or magazine. What, it, what is this all about? What's the history? What, it, what, it, what are these two pages doing there? Okay, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> There's a law on the books in New York State that requires uh, the registration, uh, it requires that every uh, legal entity that is registered with New York State, that the fact that it's been registered with New York State be published in some newspaper or other. Now, one day, somebody is going to figure out that they can publish this online and save themselves all that money. But nobody has figured it out yet. And I'm certainly not going to tell the secret outside this room. And please, nobody here go tell that secret in New York State. But um, you know, there happen to be clerks of courts in Manhattan and Brooklyn and Bronx and Staten Island and Queens who had parents and grandparents just like yours who read the Fauvelts. And when we call up and say, anything for the forward this week? Oh, yeah. You know, they want to help that way. Uh, th there is this almost you know, genetic, <laughs> you know, if you're born an American Jew in the, and you're in the third generation, you know about the forward. You know about the forward. Um, and, you know, people want to help, so they place these ads. And as long as they are willing, this is a declining business. I can show you the, I can show you the graph. It's a declining business. And one day it's going to disappear. And with it will disappear what is now about 20% of our advertising revenue. Um, so it's not a joking matter. Um, it's, it's, it's substance. But that's, that, that's what explains it. Sam, we have time for one more question. Please, one more. This is actually going to be a little bit of a follow-up on some things you've already responded to. You're actually, in what you're doing, following a journey that a lot of the Jewish organizations within Portland, I guess around the country, are going through, which is trying to reach the demographic that's no longer the ones who automatically come to the Jewish community. And when you were talking about the blogs, for instance, or how you were reaching out to the uh, yet, uh, Orthodox community. I'm wondering what kind of news attracts folks to the online versus that you don't see or, or you don't see as much of in the print version? Very, very good question. Um, until December, the largest trafficked story, the, or the uh, story we had done in 2012 that had the largest readership was our report on the nine-year-old girl who was a world-class weightlifter <laughs> in Fairlawn, New Jersey, from an Orthodox home. She could press more than her weight <laughs> And you know I can't press that kind of weight, but she, this nine-year-old girl, and people just, you know. Now, this is not the kind of journalism we set out to do, <laughs> right? I mean, we in 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 2012, we had the story. We had a two-page interview with Abu Marzouk. Abu Marzouk is, was then one of the top two people in Hamas. We sent our news editor to Cairo to interview him for three days. Um, there, was men, there were many people in the American Jewish community who thought that this was a violation of communal norms. Hamas is supposed to be shut out. They don't recognize the state of Israel. They don't accept the notion that Jews have a right to a state. They are doing their utmost to destroy it. 
why are you going to talk to them? Why do you, a Jewish newspaper, give them a platform? Isn't it enough that we have to read their garbage in the New York Times? And those were the letters that we got. I'm quoting. But we felt that there was an opportunity to import, in, in, inform our readership of the, the thinking of this man, who I think will now become the next head of um, Hamas. And uh, while the initial criticism was mainly from the right, uh, the right was pretty pleased with what this guy ended up saying. He said, no, we're not going to recognize Israel. I mean, here was an opportunity to pull the wool over American Jews' eyes and, you know, say, you know, it'll be good, it'll be nice. He said, no, this is not a mistake. It's not incidental. It's, it's not capricious. We are against the notion of a Jewish state. By the way, there's just stuff coming out this week that uh, says that Hamas, quoting some people in Hamas, that they now are prepared to, rec to accept a two-state solution, whether it's permanent uh, acceptance or for several decades acceptance or what, it's not quite clear. But Abu Marzouk wasn't saying that. He was saying, no, we don't accept it. We thought this was one of the top stories of 2012. We published the Forward 50, which gives a, a listing of the 50 people who did more than anyone else to, uh, to influence the Jewish story in the past year. We published that every November. Um, we published, we published um, some really searing reportage on um, the molestation of boys at Yeshiva University's high school in the 1980s. I mean, this had happened three decades earlier. Uh, the story really wasn't about the molestation of the boys in the 1980s. The story was that the, the venerated chancellor of Yeshiva University today, who was then president of the university, did not report these professors and administrators to the police. He enabled them to get other jobs. These are important stories for American Jewry, but they're not necessarily what uh, attracts the most readership online. N now, the biggest story we've ever had was a story we ran in December. It was a story by Naomi Zevaloff who persuaded the mother of uh, Noah Posner, one of the six-year-olds murdered in Newtown, Connecticut in December. She persuaded uh, the mother of Noah to speak to her and gave a, an amazing report on how this woman was mourning and remembering her son. And uh, we had a big readership on it then, uh, but somehow the story went viral and got picked up by Reddit. And Reddit, I mean, people on Reddit kept sending it around. It got to be the second largest, the second highest rated story that week on Reddit. And it brought us 125,000 unique visitors in one day before it shut down our site. <laughs> we had such a readership that our backup could not sustain it. We're now going to have bigger backup. But I mean, um, you never know what people are going to be interested in. It's always a surprise. It's not what the editors planned for necessarily. But you know, if, if the work is done well, if the reporting is solid, if people learn, know that they can rely on it, if the writing is done better than anywhere else, 
if it has the independence that people know they can trust and the quality and the perspective that is theirs, this is going to grow. Thank you. I want to uh, thank everyone again for coming and to thank you, Sam, for a really compelling talk and uh, a, a fascinating evening. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Dick Solomon and Elise Flitcraft again for, um, for making tonight possible. Good night, everyone. Thanks.